so pleased to have you join us this evening. We are live. It's a Q&A show. It's uh, probably one of the last shows that we're going to get in uh, as an hour and a half because we'll be going in uh, July into only back to the 60 minutes. But anyway, let's make hay while the sun shines because we do have Derek, Pastor Derek Walker from Oxford Bible Church is sitting right in front of me. Good evening, Derek. Good evening. Going to be here. You're all ready to go? Yeah. Yeah, going to be sitting in the hot seat. And of course, I have my dear friend, Mark Willis, who's no longer a cabbie. I am officially a cabbie, but I'm not driving a cab at the moment. You're retired. I'm <laughs> sort of. Retiring. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, what's that word, Derek? Is it interregnum in between, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's, that's it. Right. Gosh. Interregnum. <laughs> oh, mate, almost sounded rude. <laughs> that yeah, that so did. anyway, good. I'm assuming glad. you're a king. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, he's the king's son. Prophet was the king. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're going to be talking about the things that you want answers to. And uh, we're, Derek is going to be the one that's going to be doing all the answering. We're just going to help him a little bit here and there. But live at revelationtv.com, that's all there you, you need to do. Send in your, uh, your questions. And if you know the answers as well, put the answers in. That might help us. Uh, really, we just want to have a, a little bit of a serious time. But we have fun as well because, you know, the world out there is a bit of a miserable place right now, isn't it? and especially for some who don't have the privileges that we have here in the United Kingdom. Believe it or not, we're spoilt um, when you look at, uh, around the world. But we want to know what it is and what is God's will for us, and especially in these days and when there's so much uncertainty. So let's start with some of the questions that you're going to write in. The text number as well is on the screen. Please uh, do take part. Now, we were just talking before we went live about scriptures like uh, in, in is it Peter or John, where it's talking about the, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, where is this promised presence of his? Because it seems like it, we've been waiting 2,000 years. He said he's coming soon. Mm -hmm. You know, and yet that gives that mathematical equation of what, that 1,000 years is but a day in God's sight. So, um, you know, it's only two days since the Lord really uh, left us mm -hmm. um, and he's going to return one day. So uh, you were talking about that. So maybe we could start the ball rolling, just uh, fill that in with the well, viewers. In 2 Peter chapter 3, as you yeah. were saying, that uh, it says that there will be scoffers in the last days who say, ah, you know, all this talk about the end of the world and Jesus returning, and they'll, they'll, they'll mock that. Um, in other words, that in the last days there will be a turning away from God in society as a whole. And, and so by their doing that, they're actually fulfilling prophecy. And Peter actually responds by saying they forget the fact that God has intervened in the past. I mean, for a start, he created the world. And uh, then he says he covered the world with water in Noah's flood. And because he judged the world before, he will judge the world again. And so although it seems like the world is just carrying on, actually, judgment is coming. God will have a day in which he, uh, and it might seem like, well, God's just delaying, God, God um, can't make up his mind. But then Peter goes on and says, don't forget this one fact, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And I believe what that's saying is that God is actually on a timetable. The timetable is based on creation week. And this is what the ancient Jewish rabbis believed and the early Christians believed. It's not so well talked about now that God has a timetable. It's based on creation week, is a picture of human history. So you've got the six days of work of man, and then you have the seventh day, which is the day of rest. In the same way, there was to be 6,000 years of human history, and then the final day of rest, or the day of the Lord. And it's John in Revelation 20 confirms that, because he says that when Jesus returns, he will reign on earth for a thousand years. Now, the Old Testament talks about this time, but it never says how long. And now, Revelation 20 tells us it's a thousand years, which is exactly the number of years that fits into that blueprint. Right. So the 6,000 years of man's history, which we're more or less done right which now. Which we're pretty much at the end of yeah. now. So therefore, we can certainly look forward to the return of Christ because and then it fits in. the seventh in day, which is the rest. The thousand, the, but is that the thousand year period? and which uh, it's mentioned in Revelation, right? Exactly. Okay, so, and, seven, and so the seventh day at the end... Is completes the history. Right. And, and then, then the we're into heavens. eternity. Yeah, right, brilliant. And so the interesting thing is that 
in the story of the Passover lamb, the Jews set aside the Passover lamb on the 10th day of Nisan, and it's sacrificed on the 14th day of Nisan. So the, the Passover lamb is set aside four days before it's actually sacrificed. And this is a picture of the fact that Christ was actually set aside from the, from the foundation of, of the yeah. world. So that's the In other words, the moment man sinned, yeah. God immediately set aside his salvation, his answer. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. And so that's a hint that four days later, he'll actually be sacrificed. Yeah. And, it, it, and four, it? on God's calendar, 4,000 years later, Christ was crucified. So the first four days is from Adam to Christ on the cross. Yeah. That means the next two days, which, is the which next complete 2, the six years. days, is 2,000, two days or 2,000 years from the cross. Mm -hmm. Which is coming up soon. So, which is coming up soon. A lot of people had the millennial fever, you see, year yeah. 2000. I, I they, were reckoning, they were reckoning from his birth. Yeah. But the key date is his death. Mm -hmm. And when he rose again, he brought in the latter days. See, the former days were before the cross. The latter days, we're in the latter days now because it's the three days after the cross, the latter days. Um, and there are three latter days and we're near the end of the second one. So Christ's wow. coming is soon based mm. on that. And it's interesting, this is actually specified in Hosea. Uh, if you read Hosea... Hosea 6, I'm just You're about ahead to of me. Oh, no. About to Holy ask. Spirit. Do, you, do you want to read that from... Do you know what? Uh, this is brilliant. Verse, actually, start in Hosea 5, verse 15, if you 5, will. 15. Okay, yeah. right. And I'll jump in occasionally, but brilliant. if you read it. Derek has uh, beaten me to it. That's fantastic. Isaiah, uh, Hosea 5, 15. I will return again to my place till oh, they... Sorry, back up to verse um, 14, if 14? you would. Yeah. But I will be like a lion to Ephraim. That's it. That's yeah. Jesus, the Messiah, speaking coming as a lion to, to Israel, coming as her king. Okay, Hosea, Hosea 5.14. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, I will tear them and go away. So he's come to them, but obviously they've rejected him. And as a result, he's going to judge them. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, I will take them away, and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place. Heaven. Wow. Till they acknowledge their offence. Which is their rejection of him. Yes. So he will only be in heaven until Israel repent. Right, yeah. Yeah. And Jesus said the similar thing when he says, you, you will no longer see me, leaders of Israel, Matthew 23, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes. You see? And then, it, as we read on, we'll see what the time factor is. So he mentions the first coming when he ascends back to heaven. Yep. And he says, I'll stay there until Israel repent, until they acknowledge their offence. Yep. Okay. Until they acknowledge their offence. Then they will seek my face yep. in their affliction, which I presume in is the tribulation. Of Jacob's trouble. In yep. the tribulation. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Then it comes to chapter 6. Come and let us return to the and Lord. These are the words they use, as the leaders use in particular, to encourage the whole nation to come to. These will be the words they'll be saying at, at, at that time. For he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. So they're acknowledging their sin and the fact that God has actually judged them in, in the way you know, they've been scattered to the nations. Now there's another time period coming up next verse. Exactly. And it's this an interesting is the two verse days. that was in my, in yeah. my mind, Derek. Yeah. And then it says, after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Exactly. So the two days is the, the two, two days of the church years, age. Which is right? from the time of Christ. And then the third day is, is the, millennium. the final day when Israel will live. Yeah. In his sight. You know, I never so that's the last that. three days, the that's latter brilliant. days. You see, that is brilliant. You know, I've always wondered about that verse. Yeah. Thinking, has that got anything to do with yeah. the time at the end? Yeah. And there you go. Let's read the next. Right. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to so, us like the rain. So his going forth, that's his going forth from heaven. Yeah. Right. Is like the morning or like the dawn. So the picture of the second coming is Christ coming in his glory and lighting up the whole world. 
you see. And it's, it's saying it's as appointed as the dawn, which could mean it's, it's actually a certain thing, definitely going to happen. And secondly, it actually, uh, just like you know the time that dawn will happen when the sun will rise, so uh, there's a definite timing when it will happen, and the timing is after two days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So I believe that's one major proof that we are really in the end times. That's amazing. So what led you really to have that in open? Howard, it just popped in my mind. I'm thinking, I wonder, hang on, Derek's talking about two days, yeah. three days. I'm sure there was a Hosea two days, yeah. three days. So I just popped into there and yeah. there it is. Wow. Thank you. You've got to be anointed, though, Howard, to realise oh, it. Oh, right, yeah. that's yeah. it. I'm, I'll, I'll just leave the room now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drink my coffee, which Derek very kindly gave me, which no doubt Hillary made for us. Yes. I, I reckon she did, because it's always lovely every week. <laughs> Well, right. that's my question out of the way. That's my okay. Q&A done. That's brilliant. <laughs> see, see if there's any, any questions coming in from our viewers. They're coming in. They're coming uh, in they're it's convinced. not a Bible study as such, but it is, there's always room, I think, to learn more about the Word of God because yes. it is like a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. I was the way I used to put it. When I first read it, um, I'd say I was 21, and, and it was like putting the jigsaw puzzle, you've got the bits around the edges which are obvious, and then you end up with these pieces or understandings uh, of scriptures that you just think, you know, what does that actually mean, you know? Yeah. You know? Yep. So you put that to the side, and then you, when you read the rest of the scriptures, you suddenly go, ah, oh, that's what that means, and you put the piece back into the, the picture, and eventually, after reading the whole of the scriptures, and really sort of concentrating, I had to... I had to pummel myself, as it were, as Paul said, to actually make sure that I could pay attention and take it in. Because it is, it is profound, and it, but it's also almost in riddles. It so does it. feel that way, doesn't it? And do you know what I did discover? Derek will probably know the answer to this one. I think it was in Proverbs. There's a whole set of Proverbs that's written twice. So I, because I'd just read it, like, a few days before, and I got to it, something like the early part of Proverbs, maybe around 14 or something, and then there's later on in Proverbs, it's the same, same chapter yeah. again, exactly word for word. Oh. Anybody else come across that, or was it just a, re, a, <laughs> a, a misprint? A uh, rendition that you That's it, well, you must have been. Check that out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, Google it, and somebody find out, you know, why is there two lots of uh, Scripture exactly the same in the book of Proverbs, you know? Because you know the scribes were meticulous. Very. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they thought they were. <laughs> okay. Any, any emails? Do you know what, guys? We're absolutely flooded, so let's get going. Okay. Got a great one to start with. Evening all. Thank you for your excellent programmes. Please, can you shed some light on this? In 1 Kings 17.4, why was Elijah fed by ravens? We read in Leviticus 11.15 that they are unclean birds. So what is the significance of God ordering these unclean birds to feed Elijah? Is there some spiritual lesson here that I can't fathom? I think it was practical, wasn't it? I mean, there w it's, not a, it's not a moral problem because unclean simply mean that they couldn't be used as sacrifices. Um, all of God's creatures are, you know, good in the sense that they're created by God, but then uh, unclean ones were not suitable for sacrifice. So there's nothing wrong with God using ravens as such. Uh, you know, they're as created of God as any other creature. Mm. It's, it's a supernatural, it, it's a, I don't know, that's God's sense of humor that he would use, use ravens to, to feed him. But I haven't, I must admit, I haven't particularly seen any Big significant special mm. lesson in that. It was just a practical thing, wasn't it? Because he was up in the caves or somewhere up in the brook. Uh, I mean, it, it's supernatural that ravens okay. would actually yeah. bring food Cherith, to yeah. Elijah. Yeah. yeah, it seems you know. Have, be, have you been there to Brook Cherith? No. I think I have. It's a very tiny brook. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's, yeah, okay. It's a, well, a good it's question. A, interesting question. About it's a good question. Great one, yeah. mm. great one. I can't think of any great si spiritual mm. significance in that. Yeah. But obviously, Elijah had to walk by faith you know, when God told him, yeah. uh, "I'll feed you by the rain." By ravens. Was he running away at that time? From... He was in hiding, from, really. From, from that queen. He made the announcement of yeah. drought, right. and the king was searching for him, mm. for his. To, to was it King him. Ahab? King Ahab, mm. and so he was laying low, you might say, yeah. just really taking yeah. time out, getting close to God, getting ready for when God spoke to him next. Um, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Next one. 
Another, another good one here. <coughs> Did Jonah die and plead to God from Hades? If so, are people's prayers answered after death from Marcus? This is a good one. Wow. I, I believe that Jonah did die myself. Yeah. If you, if you read Jonah 2 literally, it's what happened is that um, he was obviously thrown off the boat and he begins sinking. And uh, he can, you can kind of hold your breath for about three minutes, which was the time in which he would go down to the bottom of the ocean because he talks about the seaweed going around him. And he talks about himself dying, his soul fainting within him. And then it talks about him after his death, he actually went down under the earth. And earth with its uh, prison enclosed around him. And uh, meanwhile, his body was picked up by this whale, this whale or big fish, scooped up his body and then gave him a taxi ride to where he needed to be. And after the three days, God got him out of Hades and he found himself back in the body. When well, uh, he prayed, he said he prayed uh, to God from, yeah, the, from well, the stomach of the whale. He prays, yes. When he gets out, when, when he gets back in the fish, we can look at it in a minute if you like. When he gets back in the fish, of course, he's still a man in trouble. Now he's got out of Hades, but he's in the belly of a fish. Uh, and no, by this time, he's covered in acid scars. Mm -hmm. But he, he realizes God has started the miracle in him. And then he says, I will offer, I, no, he says, I offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Which is now he is saying, I, basically, when you offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving is when you thank God before you see the answer. And you thank him and, and he thanks God that he's going to get him out of this out of this fish. Mm. And then it says, when he offered up the sacrifice of thanksgiving, the, the fish vomited him out onto dry land. So the fish, meanwhile, had been taking him near the shore. And then his final escape happened there. So I do believe he died. If you take it literally, he died. And that's why it's a perfect type of Christ mm -hmm. who died um, and was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Doesn't Christ actually allude to this in a prophetic in way Matthew before, 12. yeah, yeah. yeah. But this but just as like Jonah it. was three days yeah. and three nights in the belly of the fish, that's his body was, mm -hmm. so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Yeah. He prays, um, he prays uh, before Chapter he, two. let's just quickly Chapter read two. it. Yeah. Um, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. So this is actually at the end of the three days and three nights he's praying. And then he's looking back and telling the history of what happened. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. So he actually cried out of Hades. And you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods over surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. So this is him sinking. As he's sinking, he said, Then I said, I've been cast out of your sight. He realizes he'd sinned. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. So he was already in faith as he was drowning. This is outstanding faith. As he's drowning, He's in faith that God's going to deliver him out of this situation, which seemed hopeless. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. That means he's to the point of death. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. Now, this had proved this was a real experience because nobody knew until this point that there are mountains at the bottom of the sea, which has been proved by science since. But Jonah was there. He saw it. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. So he actually goes now into Hades. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. So he's been resurrected out of Hades. O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And then he says, I will sacrifice to you, or literally, I sacrifice to you, verse 9, with a voice of thanksgiving. Salvation is of the Lord. So he's in faith all the way. He's in faith. But God took him, I think, as a type of Christ. God took him. And just, and then he, when he rose again, with acid scars on his body, he preached for 40 days at Nineveh. And same way, Christ, when he rose again, he had scars on his body. And he preached for 40 days. So mm, a there's a whole typology type, there. Yeah. Mm.
Wow. So God heard his prayers, yes, even, even from Sheol in that case. But um, the Bible is clear that uh, once, once you die, now I do believe that somebody can die and be resuscitated and come back, you know, but there comes a point, it's a cut-off point, and then there's no coming back. Once that silver cord is broken. You know. Yeah. But there is, uh, you do hear stories of people who, who do physically die, and they talk about going mm. down into hell, or, or heaven, but some go down like to hell. Ian McCormick. Uh, and, uh, and, and yet there is a kind of, if their body can be brought back to life, um, then it's possible that, you know, God will have mercy on them. Okay. Yeah. Next one. Good question. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. does come out yeah. with some good questions. <coughs> Amanda from Belfast. Do you think the attack on the oil tankers today will turn into something more serious? Hands up. I've not heard of this. Attack on the oil yes, tankers. Yes, there was... Two a month tankers. ago, it, probably Iran, but they don't say it, but everyone thinks Iran did that. And now there's been another attack on two oil tankers. That's a good pass that straight to... Homage, yeah. homage. What do you call it? Homage. Homage. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone suspects Iran. Because yes, Iran it is, is potentially dangerous. Iran is threatened, but there is the other side that somebody could be setting Iran up um, to actually take the blame and therefore it, it would bring on uh, America's response. Okay? Yeah. And even I heard, and I obviously, this is, these are the rumours that have talked about, that even Israel could have actually done something to provoke that, to actually make it look like Iran's doing. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't believe that. But that's one of the things that was said today. In that case, they would more likely... Well, just anyway, finish the job anyway. Tor they it think it might be a tor torpedo. Yes. Yeah. But yes, it, it's possible. But then they would more likely attack American vessels. Mm -hmm. But these are other, not American vessels as such. But yeah, it is, to answer the question, yes, this is exactly the kind of thing that could could build up yeah. uh, and become a major thing. One thing that we do know from Scripture is that there be rumours of wars and all of that. We know that in Kingdom Against Kingdom, you know, all those sort of things that Jesus spoke about. But there would always be these little skirmishes, if you want to call it that. But one day it's going to turn into yes. you something never know. quite... I mean, look what Armageddon. started World War I, you know. It was an assassination, wasn't it? Mm. And then you wouldn't imagine what come out of that event. So it's just one event that can be a ca catalyst that then the dominoes start mm. rolling. Now, in amidst all of this, didn't somebody get an assassinated and then it was kept very quiet about... What, recently? Yes. And it always something to do with the Balkans. There's always something that happens around the Balkans or whatever. I'm not sure. And somebody, uh, as has happened in the past, you know. Yeah. You got me. You know, what, but definitely, when, when one reads that, one's thinking, yes, yeah. this is getting dangerous. Wow, OK. Yeah. So I'll basically, Jerry, I'll carry on reading your book, which I'm 83 <laughs> yeah, pages into. Oh, are you mentioning this book? Oh, I am mentioning that book, because it is fantastic. The book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation. It's my commentary on yeah. the Book of yeah. Revelation. That's a great picture. It is available from oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk. Mm. I've got my son lined up, ready to read it direct when he gets back from, uh, from Belgium. Great. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Right, we've got a question here that is often asked by believers and unbelievers. <coughs> Hi, Revelation, I love your show, and that's not said to get my question asked, but my question is this. What are ghosts, and are they biblical? <laughs> um, you know, ghosts... Is it demonic activity? It could, yes, if they're real. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's imagination, isn't it? But... Uh, Yes. The only mention of something be. like that is when um, Samuel was dug up, as it were, yeah. brought up by the witch of Endor. One, one theory is that these, there is kind of human spirits before they go up or down. Mm. They can hang around for a bit. I don't there's believe no, that. There's nothing in the scripture no biblical about that, is there? basis for that. Yeah. It, it could be a demonic, yeah. uh, if it's real. I believe it's probably a demonic activity. In Deuteronomy, it warns us not to play around with spiritistic practices it in fact it demons impersonate said, the yes. dead that's the yeah, that's what's right. mean the meaning of familiar spirits yeah, yeah. they're like a saint contacted through seances if it's real supernatural stuff it's actually demons impersonating the dead wow. because they have knowledge of those dead people um and so ghosts i imagine if it's real uh, is a demonic activity mm. that says uh, in 
Deuteronomy chapter 18 says that in verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or the one who casts a spell or a medium or a spiritist, a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. Okay, for whoever does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable things, the Lord your God will drive you out from before you, before them. It, it, so it, it, there's divination, there's all sorts of demonic practices that humans do in order to evoke these spirits. But they're, it's not ghosts that we call them. No, cause that's slow, yeah, but ghosts, if, they're, if, they're, if there's anything to them, um, has to be demonic. But that term in some scriptures uh, or translations of, uh, of uh, Samuel, they say they, that the ghost of Samuel was... Well, that, is a, like, that was a one-off case because the so, Bible actually says it was Samuel in yeah. that case. So, it wasn't so the, the even, the, even the medium was shocked because yeah. she wasn't yeah. used to a manifestation and like that. And she didn't want to get involved. She knew what Samuel coming out of Hades. Yeah. God did that as a special one-off thing yeah. to actually pronounce judgment on Saul, the person who yeah. was doing this. Is that in the book of Kings? Uh, or in Samuel? Probably, probably Samuel. Hand, yeah. and, and it's, it's clear that it actually is Samuel. But again, it, a judgment came on the person doing this. Um, the medium in, was shocked by it because mm. <laughs> she knew this was not her normal experience yeah. as to what happened. Um, so that was kind of like one of God, God's one-off kind of surprises, if you like. Yeah. Because when I call them doors of death, if you, God has certain boundaries. Uh, and if, and the, one of the most serious ones are, is the occult boundary. And if you cross mm. that, you are exposing yourself to death, essentially. Mm. And uh, if you touch that area, you're inviting evil things to, yeah. to come on you. And uh, so in that case, judgment came on Saul for doing it, but it actually was Samuel in that situation. But normally it would be an evil spirit impersonating mm. the dead, a familiar spirit. Good stuff. Another good one. Good evening to you all. Thank you for your great programs. Please, can you explain the showbread in the temple? I heard you once say that it was related to our emotions, question mark. What is the significance for us today as temples of the Holy Spirit? Thank you to all for the work that you do, especially behind the scenes. Well, this is kind of getting into deeper things, but I believe that the temple is, an, an, is a picture of us because we are the ultimate temple of the Holy Spirit. So a temple's in three parts. And that corresponds to spirit, soul, body. The Holy of Holies is our spirit. And God, and that is meant to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so the Ark of the Covenant is like God's throne. And when we're born again, God comes and sits on his throne in, in the spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, there's three items in the holy place, which is the menorah, the table of showbread, and the uh, altar of incense. And I, my own logic says, and I know Derek Prince says this, although he has a different identification, the three things in our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And so I thought, well, surely those three line up. And I think they do. Um, I believe that the menorah, for example, is, is, is our mind. A mind that is illuminated with the light of God. And, and it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding. There's seven of them, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, Isaiah 11. Uh, and so when our temple is functioning as it ought to, if you like, the menorah in our soul is lit up with the light of the spirit. I believe the table of the showbread is actually, literally, it's the bread of the presence. And the idea of this bread, this table of bread, and there were 12 of them that represented the 12 tribes, was put before the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, the bread of the presence. And, and the Jews record that a supernatural miracle happened. They put it in there every Sabbath, and that bread was fresh all week, which is a miracle, you know. And the idea, I believe that's our emotions. I believe we should be putting, presenting our emotions you know, in the presence of God. So often if we're hurt or we're feeling down or whatever, we try and comfort ourselves with, with the wrong stuff. 
God wants us to keep our emotions in the presence of God through praise and worship. And then that, that way he keeps our hearts soft and fresh, yeah. emotionally fresh. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so when you worship God, you find yourself refreshed emotionally. And that's what that pictures. And the other thing is the altar of incense, which is right near the Holy of Holies. I believe that's our will because the altar of incense is, is our worship, our incense going up from a surrendered will. And the way the temple works, actually, I believe the engine is the altar, the altar in the outer court. It's the uh, altar of burnt offering. And Romans 12 says that we are to offer our body as a living sacrifice. And as we do that, what happens is that that releases the life to flow out of the Holy of Holies. It says, then you're transformed through the renewing of your mind. There's a transformation, there's a release of life. So when you, the engine is the altar. As you offer yourself a living sacrifice, the life in the Holy of Holies flows out, lights up your menorah, you start getting revelation, refreshes your emotions, and the wor your worship also ascends like incense. And um, what is released from the Holy of Holies, by the way, is the three things in the Ark of the Covenant, the manna, the pot of manna, the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod that budded. So Aaron's rod that budded, for instance, that represents your ministry. Yeah. See, that, that Aaron's rod, that marked him out as the real high priest because his, 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 that almond rod supernaturally budded. And that was, that's resurrection life, that's genuine yeah. life. So that, that signifies that when, this, when we walk in the Spirit, one thing that comes forth from the Spirit is the ministry that God has for us. Yes, gotcha. And then the, the Ten Commandments represents God's law. As, as, the, as the temple works as it ought to, God's law is written in our hearts. And then the pot of manna also represents Christ. He's the bread of life. He satisfies our soul. So anyway, the whole thing is brilliant picture language of, of how, a temp, how we are meant to be as a temple. Yeah. But what I do now when I worship God, I, I imagine, as it were, my emotions being refreshed by the presence of God. It's one big that. benefit of worship. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. and I, I, read, I read last night as well that the Aaron's budding rod, uh, rod that budded uh, is a sign of our spiritual authority as well because we've got resurrection yeah. life. Spiritual, spiritual authority really and ministry. Night. Yes, for the ministry. That, that is released, to. but only released when we are surrendering to God. Yes. Um, yeah. Offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, this one's interesting. I'm not sure what it's aiming at. What are the ingredients of a rainbow? I'm not sure if that means spiritually. Um, well, I'll put it this way. There is a picture language in a rainbow because it's all the colors of the spectrum. But it's, it's formed by light going through water droplets. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then that causes a radiance. So, um, it was probably not a rainbow until after the flood, of course, because it didn't really rain before the flood. Yeah, it seems such. like that was a yeah, sign of yeah. the new conditions. And uh, God's promise, really, that he wouldn't do that again. Now, I, I might be taking uh, imagery too far, yeah. but uh, you could see it as the spirit, God's light, shining through his word, is the multicolored grace of God. Because a rainbow flow is above the throne of God, you know. In fact, it, a, a rainbow is actually circular. So it was, it's like an engagement ring. And there's a rainbow around God's throne, which means it's a throne of grace. Grace is radiating out from the throne. And I see that's the spirit f going through the word, the spirit and the word together. Yeah, the, the light going through the water droplets creates this multifaceted rainbow of God's grace. That's how I tend to see that. Howard, any comments? Rainbows? No, uh, uh, it's just all tied up in the beauty uh, of God's creation, really, and uh, how magnificent everybody goes, oh, look at that rainbow over there. And we're not just remembering it because it, it's God's covenant that he wouldn't do that again, but it's more or less, you know, it's just the beauty of it, you know, it just yeah. shows you. Yeah, uh, the glorious, the glory of God, really. It's and nothing because compared it's a to circle. To it's God's saying, mm. that's, you know, like wedding ring, a circle. It's God's never-ending love and grace to us. Yeah. 
That's good. Good questions Steve. coming in here. Steve yeah. from Cumbria. It's a good place to come from. Evening, Steve. Lovely place. Yeah. Hi, it's guys. Eden up there, mate. Yeah. Hi, guys. In my daily walk Bible, it says the writer of Hebrews is unknown. Does Derek have any idea who could have have written Hebrews? Thanks, Steve from Cumbria. Well, I'm personally convinced that the, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. And um, reasons. one reason would be that uh, I don't think anyone else could pull it off. You know, it's a kind of so in-depth that uh, there would be very, peop very few people yeah. Cause like it's the imagine. history, isn't it, of, of, yeah. of Judaism, really, in a sense, and what, how it's interpreted to, for the Christian as well, and all the meanings of all the things that were uh, practiced in Judaism, uh, including the high priest, the role of the high priest, the, 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 the slaying of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, yes, and all of those things are spiritually connected to the Christian era, and uh, Apostle Paul was, as you rightly say, was, was definitely the man, I think. I think I have some scriptural proof as well, because in 2 Peter, um, 2 Peter tends to write to the Jewish. He's the apostle to the Jews. Uh, certainly in 1 Peter, he makes it clear that he's writing primarily to the Jewish dispersion. Um, that's in 1 Peter. And 2 Peter is like a follow-up letter and um, right at the end of 2 Peter, and remember he's writing primarily to, to Jews, he's the apostle to the Jews, and he says um, that the long, 2 Peter 3.15, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as, our, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles. So he's singling out a, a particular epistle that Paul has written to the Jewish people, to the Hebrews, mm. as he has well, written in all great, his yeah. epistles. Yeah. I've not heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of them, and then he says, then he says that it's scripture. Mm. So at this time, uh, both Paul and Peter are in jail. They've been arrested for the last time. Uh, this is AD 64, 65 by Nero when he was persecuting the church. And I, 2 Peter was written from prison just before Peter was killed. And he's referencing a letter that Paul wrote. And clearly in Hebrews, it was a time of great persecution on the church. So it's pretty much at the same time. And he actually references there, yeah. I believe, Hebrews. That seals it for me. Yeah. Uh, at the end of Hebrews as well, it does say, greet all our leaders and all the saints, those from Italy greet you. Yes. So the person signing off. And he mentions Timothy. Yeah, exactly. See, Paul and Timothy were like that. Exactly. And he, yeah. he talks about Timothy, I think, at the end of Hebrews. And so it, it's, it fits for me. It's got to be Paul. Yeah, makes sense. You'll find a reference to Timothy in Hebrews. Yes, it is. Well, it's right there at the end as well. Yeah. You said uh, Timothy's been released. You see. In verse 23, take so, notice that our brother Timothy has been released. With so he whom? Paul's in prison, yeah. along with Peter and yeah. many of the other leaders. And he's but Timothy's been released, well, you see. You know? So to me, it is Paul. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, next one. Good stuff, great. Hi, well, Howard, Mark, Derek. It's a pleasure to watch as always. Thank you for a fantastic, informative show. I wonder if you could shed some light on something that I've pondered over, over between the date of Jesus' resurrection the Feast of First Fruits and Pentecost, Jews counted 50 days. Jesus ascended on day 40 of this time. I was wondering, with your interest in numbers, etc., if you knew if there was any significance to this, to Jesus ascending on day 40, and also if there's anything to the fact that there are nine days where nothing happened, so to speak. Many thanks. Let me make a slight correction. Yep. This is right down my street. Um, it's interesting that it says that he only appeared to the apostle, it's actually day 41, in the sense the count of the 50 days starts from the Sunday of first fruits to the Sunday that we call Whitson or Pentecost. And that's 50 days, including both Sundays at each end. Now, Jesus rose on a Sunday, but he only appeared to the apostles Sunday evening. Now, in the Jewish counting, it's, it's the, the next, next day. day. Right, right, of course. So I'll, I'll prove this in a minute. So the 40-day count started on the day after the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So if you're counting the day of resurrection, that's day one, then there are 40 days. Now the proof of that is, is if you count 40 days, the, the final day, which is when Jesus ascended to heaven, 
would then be a Friday. Okay, and he ascended to heaven, and, and what it says, I think, in Acts 1 is, he ascended to heaven, and then they walked back, and it says in Acts 1 that it was a Sabbath day's journey. Now, why do you think they said it was a Sabbath day's journey? Because it was the Sabbath. Sabbath it's like they're right. saying, we yeah. kept the Sabbath, because, in other words, Jesus ascended, say, 6 o'clock on the Friday. Night. Mm -hmm. Now it's the Sabbath, and now they would make their walk back to town, but get... it was a legal walk because it was a Sabbath day's journey. So that, that means there were 41 days. That means there were eight days in which they had their prayer meeting. They all prayed together for eight days. And then, of course, the day of Pentecost was the 50th day when the Spirit fell, when they were at the temple, by the way, not at the upper room. They were all together in one place at the temple, and the Spirit fell. So there is a significance to the number 40, of course, you know. Um, but uh, Well, it's, it, that happens so many times, that, that 40, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days, wasn't it, the, in the wilderness? It's the time of testing, isn't it? 40 well. days. Uh, I also, there was another... It was 40 years in the wilderness, testing. Yes. Yeah. I, I would call it a time of preparation okay. yep. and testing. And, and it's like if you pass the test, if you go through the time of preparation, you enter into the next phase. So, in, in a way, that was 40 days where the Lord was preparing the apostles for what was going to happen next. Makes sense. Yep, good stuff. It's amazing, though, what happened at Pentecost. I mean, that was must have been so exhilarating yeah. to see and to be part of that. And, and I suppose it was great encouragement to all of those that had missed the Lord because they, some were really not quite fully understanding why he had to die. Uh, but for all of that to come about and then to see the tongues of fire and or the understanding... God was anointing his new temple, mm. you see, on, on the very mm. temple site. God was now... The fire represents the fire on the altar. They were burnt offerings to God. The fire, normally you can't see the fire, but it always happens when you're filled with the Spirit. The fire of God comes on you and they begin being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this is God filling his new temple, inaugurating his new temple. Incredible. Okay. <coughs> this one often pops up, Derek. Is getting cremated okay? And does your soul go to be with the Lord if you are a believer straight away? And that's from uh, Mark. Yes, I believe straight away because it says to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. So there's no time delay, really. Yeah. You leave your body, if you're a believer, yeah. you go straight up into the presence of God. Yeah. Uh, and so very little time to take place. So whether you're cremated or buried or whatever, if you're a believer, you will go into the presence of God. Um, and your body will be resurrected in due time, even if you're cremated. You know, if you died in a fire, for instance, mm -hmm. if God is not able to reconstitute and resurrect your body, if you're, if you're turned to ashes, then it's a bit tough on those who die in a fire. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, even so, the sea, so in even that the sense, sea. it doesn't yeah. make a difference. Yes. Even but the sea on the other hand, it's dead. more biblical to be buried. It seems like all the believers in the Bible were buried rather than cremated. So cremation was more a thing that the, the world did. But So I personally would prefer to be buried. That's my, would be in my will to be buried. Because it's more biblical, wife, yeah, but I don't think it would really affect your eternal right. destiny. You know. I agree. It's tough. Yeah, I told Leslie just to get a van and put me in a box and do cardboard <laughs> boxes, just wheel me down there to the grave. You know. You'll outlive all of us. You will running around <laughs> playing football. <laughs> <laughs> right, Mark from Leeds here. The marks are on the on the case tonight. Evening, gents. We were just chatting about this a little bit before we went live. Do you feel after round one of today's Conservative Party leadership contest? that it will affect anything towards a no-deal Brexit? And is there scripturally, uh, is it that, and is there scripturally that we are heading in this direction? And that's Mark from Leeds. Yes, I believe that it's pretty clear to me that uh, if we're going to have a Brexit, it's going to be a no-deal Brexit. It's got to be, because the EU is not going to change their offer, and we're not going to suddenly decide to accept that offer. So it's either, if there's going to be a Brexit, which I... I personally believe is, is God's will, um, then it will have to be a no-deal Brexit. And we, we would need a, a leader that has the guts to, to bring that through. Um, and I guess, hopefully, 
if it's Boris, that he has the guts mm. to do that. But it's not so much... But Dominic to... Raab is the other one, I think. The problem is actually getting it through Parliament, because, uh, you know, the, especially when... Well, they lost that vote a minority, recently, you know? You know? so that helped. Yeah. But uh, it's... God's will will be done. That's what I, I'm hoping as well, you know, and I believe, like you... I, I think that because be, it's the default position out. is to leave... Mm. Um, if if we had a leader with sufficient guts, they and courage. They could courage, they could do it. But it, it will need a lot of courage, and we must pray that the right one is a, is elected. That God's a good point. choice is elected. That's very important. Yeah. 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 Coke or no coke? Yep. Got one here from uh, Jenna. Hello to all. Great show as usual. My question, I love this question, <coughs> is Ezekiel 43 to 46 seems to imply that sacrifices will carry on in the millennial kingdom. Why is this necessary if Christ died once and for all time? And how is it even possible if death has been abolished at the return of Christ? I feel like I'm misunderstanding something. Thanks for your help. Right. Well, death is not abolished as such at the return of Christ yet. Death is only finally abolished at the end of the thousand years. So yes. if we take scripture literally, Christ will return. Now, death will be pushed back. People will live much longer, but people will still be living on earth in their natural bodies and animals likewise. And so although the curse will be taken off the earth, it, it, we're not yet in the eternal state. That will happen at the end of the thousand years. So that, to say that. that. And about sacrifices, yes, I, I, um, I take the Bible literally. So I know, although it seems to contradict our Christian theology, I, I believe we should submit to the Bible as it stands. Now, what you've got to understand about even the sacrifices before Christ, they had no saving power. They were essentially visual aids to teach people and prepare people for the sacrifice of Christ. There is only one sacrifice that has value. Animal blood couldn't say, didn't save them. They, they, it was only their connection to the sacrifice of Christ that they had value. So in other words, they're teaching aids. So imagine what it's like in the millennium. Hardly anyone dies, apart from the occasional person of capital punishment. Um, death is pushed back, so people still need to get saved. Those who get born in the millennium, they're living in this perfect world. They may, wouldn't feel the need to be saved. I mean, everything's perfect and there's no death in sight. They need to hear the gospel and the sacrifices will be used by God as part of preaching the gospel and the go sacrifices, the teaching is, you know, that this is what sin is. You, you are a sinner. And their punishment has to be paid for sin. And the sacrifices will be a teaching tool, as they always have been. They're not replacements of the sacrifice of Christ, but they will point to the sacrifice of Christ, saying, Christ has taken your, the punishment for your sin, but you have to accept Christ for yourself. Otherwise, you will pay the price. So God will use the sacrifices to teach that there is a consequence to sin, which is death. And, but where uh, does the third temple come in then? What, what's its That's purpose? the fourth temple. Okay. So, yeah, you've got Solomon's temple as the first Herod. temple. Then you've got, yeah, the second temple, which became Herod's temple at the time of Christ. There will be a third temple, I believe, in the tribulation, which will only stand for a short time before the Antichrist will desecrate it. Right. But again, there will be sacrifices in that, and people struggle with that mm. as to why God yeah. would allow that. Mm. But again, it will be part of God's final outreach to Israel, because while sacrifices are being made at the temple, and there's four prophecies that talk about the third temple, um, the two witnesses will be there preaching the gospel. And they will be saying, Christ, that the sacrifices will be the visual aid, and they'll be saying, Christ, your Passover lamb has been sacrificed for you. Accept Christ, okay? And so God will use that to reach Israel. Then when Jesus returns, Ezekiel um, 40 to 48 describes this fourth temple, which will stand during the millennium, which will be the most glorious of all the temples. The, the house of the Lord, and uh, that will be uh, the law of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem. 
And that fourth temple, again, has a sacrificial system. But it's not the, it's not the sacrificial system of Moses. It's a different sacrificial system. But again... Is this it, just for the Jews? It, uh, primarily, I suppose. But mm. all, all, it talks about God's being a, a house for all nations. But again, it, 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 it's primarily the temple and the sacrifices is, is God's teaching tools. Mm. Because you can't see a Christian going into the temple and making a sacrifice, knowing that really they, no. their Messiah, our Messiah, yeah. no, has, has exactly. already paid that price. Exactly. So it would be a contradiction for them to do that, and a renegade almost to go back and do that. Yes, and again, those sacrifices in the, the third temple is, is basically for the Jews, because the, the thing is, the Jews right now have a legalistic works religion. Yep. They believe that mm -hmm. you're saved by doing good works. Yeah. So God has to remind them, because they haven't had a temple for 2,000 years, they've forgotten that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. So God's going to use the temple as a reminder to them of that fundamental truth that salvation is through blood. And, and that's part of the preaching of the gospel to them. Yeah. You look like you're going to say something. No, 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 I'm just a thinking... Sharp that, intake of yeah, no, no, it's because uh, it, it, that's quite a deep one, isn't it? That is a heavy one, you know. Yeah. Ezekiel 40 to 48, yeah. yeah so it helps to understand, you know, somehow people's got in their mind that the sacrifices before Christ, people were saved through those sacrifices. They weren't. You can't be saved by animal blood. Yeah. They were pictures. Mm. And, and in a sense, through that sacrifice, you laid hold of the virtue of the Messiah, if you believed in that. But the sacrifice itself had no value. And likewise, sacrifices afterwards don't have value in themselves. They, they point to Christ. Mm. Like communion elements, they, they point to Christ. Yep. They don't have value yeah, in themselves. Yep. Yep. It'll be like that, mm. I think. Makes sense. Got a good one from Dave. Hi, folks. We Christians use a cross as a symbol of our belief in Jesus. However, the Jews don't believe in Jesus like we do, but still obviously believe in God. What do the Jews use as a symbol of their belief in God, if they have one? Um, the nearest thing is well, the, the prayer, uh, what do you call them on the, on the bottom of your garments? They have different oh, the, things. They, they, the tie, they tie scriptures. Or, the tie aren't they? Yeah, that's it. Tassels on yeah. there. Yeah, they, they tie scriptures on there. Yeah. Because they, but the, uh, those that are in Israel go obviously go to the wall. Yes, you know. So they haven't actually got a symbol. I don't say. think the Star of David is just a national identity, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Rather than the symbol. I don't. I don't think a they menorah? have something. A menorah is a common one. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. I don't think they have a definitive one yeah. quite like the cross. No. I think the menorah is probably the one that 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 they they look to. As, as a some sort of comfort and a reminder of their past. Yeah. It's a very powerful one. And it's nice that actually Britain actually gave them that one yeah. that's outside the Knesset, isn't that's it? That's good. Mm. Good one. Good question, Dave. This is, uh, I think this one's up your street as well, Derek. <laughs> uh, hi. I've pon pondered over this for a while now. And the day like a thousand years and enemy time is short whilst God <sighs> rests on day seven, maybe. Jesus died and was re resurrected, so didn't he come back soon when he was resurrected? Surely God has nothing left to wait for except for us to bring earth to heaven when we have a tipping point of stopping disobedience to him. As Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, not a Christian, doesn't that mean all the answers are already there? That's why I love listening to you and your guests. Derek, when did God start the clock and is the earth old but our human idea of time not to measure the whole creation. Blessings from Deborah. There's a bit of everything going on. There's a lot in there. Up <laughs> uh, a day, I, I personally think that the earth might be old, but the, the count of a day with a thousand years starts from Adam. Right. So it starts from the creation of man. Whether you think there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 one, one, and 1-2 one, two. Two, or 1-2 and 1-3, or one, and one, before the seven days of creation actually start. That's a different issue. But um, basically, I do believe that Adam was essentially 6,000 years ago. And, um, and so we are getting close to Christ's return. Yeah. Now, well, after Christ, it's, 
The scriptures came to us in the New Testament after Christ rose from the dead. Jesus himself pro predicted that he came the first time in humility. He would suffer, die, and rise again and descend to heaven. That was all prophesied. But he also prophesied that he will return to earth. Yeah. We, we are not called to bring earth to heaven in the sense of taking over the earth and then making it perfect for Christ. That's not common, we, no, no, dominion we're not, theology. Yes, dominion theology. Yeah. We, our great commission is to preach the gospel to all Just creation, at that. to bring in a soul harvest. But, but only Jesus himself, it, he predicted that he will return to earth in power and glory, and he will set up his kingdom on earth. And so, meanwhile, we need to be busy preaching the gospel and uh, when God decides the time is right, you know, he will return and move the earth into the next phase. I hear what uh, the, the writer is saying there, I think if I get it, get it <coughs> properly, is that when he was on the Mount of Olives the night before, he, um, you know, he was betrayed that evening, mm. uh, when he spoke to his disciples about what was going to happen, and, and if he did say there, I'm coming soon, but there's also oh, a coming... Yeah, well there is a coming soon again in the last book of the Bible. Yeah. Um, it's, it's in Revelation, isn't it? Behold, yeah. I am coming soon. And he yeah. also, as you said as well, Derek, in Matthew 28, talking about what, we're, what our role is, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you, and look, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So he's not with us in flesh no, but by his spirit by his spirit he and said something interesting as well when he said my kingdom is not of this world absolutely which means you know we're in the world but we're not of it mm. they so were trying his to kingdom get him will into come it. into this world but it's not of this world which means it's going to come from above he says therefore my servants do not fight to establish the kingdom so he's basically saying my kingdom is coming but it's going to come from above and impose itself on the world and take over the world systems. But it won't come from within the world. It's not of this world. In other words, we're not going to do a jihad and take over the world for Christ. That's right. not the plan. Which his disciples were trying <coughs> to get him to do mm. at that time. Yeah, it's and the human yeah. reasoning approach. You're going to set up your kingdom now. He said, world. no. You know? Exactly. Going, uh, the last uh, chapter in Revelation. And it's the, the very uh, penultimate uh, verse. It said, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Okay, so Jesus already says that. I'm coming quickly. After so two his days. resurrection. Yes. But this was even right after he'd given the word to John through the angel. Yeah. Quickly. Yeah. means suddenly. Yeah. It doesn't mean soon. But actually. even two days is quick. It means suddenly. Because it's two days in God's eyes yeah. uh, with a thousand year yeah. rule. But uh, strictly, it's talking about the rapture, which when the rapture happens, it will be suddenly, which means without notice, it'll suddenly happen. And we could be, we'll be talking, and then suddenly we'll find ourselves standing before Christ in the air. Mm. Oh, and, and it's going to happen quickly. There'll be no warning. Mm. It'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. Yep. And uh, it will be uh, sudden. And that's what the word actually means, suddenly. <coughs> I think Re uh, also Revelation talks about the, the Babylon, the great falling, suddenly. And that's all going to happen oh, pretty one much hour, the same. In one hour, in other words, will fall. It's a display of his power. You see, mm. if there isn't much power, then it takes a long time for something to happen. Mm. But when you're talking about omnipotence, mm. it's suddenly. You know, yeah. and so one sign of God's activity is the suddenlies of God, mm. like on the day of Pentecost, suddenly. Mm. And uh, and so when something happens suddenly, it, in a way, that's a sign of the power of God. Mm. So. Uh, okay. So we always must be on our alert. Always, you know, like exactly. the five uh, wise virgins. Yeah. It's the imminence of the rapture. Mm. It Christ. could happen at any time. Amen. <coughs> Please. The next question <laughs> is from Ricky, and uh, this will interest, I would hazard a guess, every single one of you out there, and it's straight from the heart, and it's very honest. Hi. Why does God most of the time not answer prayer? It's so painful dealing with sickness and with trials. 
Why does God seem to remain silent? Am I doing something wrong? Psalm 22 and Psalm 73 are comforts. Thanks from Ricky. Now that is hard. Well, that's over to you, Howard. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, okay. I've done a lot. That today, Give really. Derek a rest. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> really, we're told, and we were even read tonight, really, that the saints, you know, are going to suffer uh, through persecution, um, and some of us will be sick, some of us will be thrown in prison, all the different things. It's not a bed of roses being a Christian, um, although it's really lovely when you come across the truth and you know God's love and his, in the way that he sent his son and gave up uh, his life uh, for us uh, willingly, etc. Um, you fall in love with the, that particular character. So it's out of character to think that God would actually um, let us be sick just for the sake of it, mm. you know? We are a fallen race. Um, we've deserved everything we get, mm. you know? He, the, yeah, because we're sinners and the ruler, the, the, the sinner will die, you know? It's a, you know, he who sins will Soul die. sins will die. die. This is yeah. Ezekiel and it's all the way through. So we have a redeemer and we know one day when we pass through the veil of death, uh, or we're caught up uh, in the rapture or whatever, is that's no more sickness, no more pain, no more crying, no more sorrow. These are the things we can look forward to because the new heaven and earth are, are there for something for us to encourage us to get to that day. We are all going to get sick or die somehow, um, uh, unfortunately. It's not because God hates us or anything, it's just we're a fallen race. He goes all the way back to Adam, and uh, we can see uh, the sin in man. Uh, but the hope and the glory is all through what Christ has done for us in, and, uh, and is doing for us, because the encouragement that we get from each other, even the setting up of uh, organizations, ministries, uh, to minister unto people. If, if, the, if the shepherds get it right, we're here to help you all and to encourage you, all the more so as we behold the day drawing near. So God uh, does heal, but whether he heals everyone, it's just something that, it's an enigma because it doesn't in character with God. Because if, if I was God or something like that, you'd say you wouldn't want to see somebody suffer. He, but even Jesus saw people suffer, but he would heal them. Why? Because he loves them. But there were things that we as we read and, and experience in life, it isn't as straightforward as that. But the, we know that the hope for the future is fantastic. Just got to get there. Jesus said so many times, he who overcomes will inherit the kingdom of God and all the promises of the new heaven and the new earth. We've got to overcome. And overcoming, it's like being in the SAS or the equivalent of the Navy SEALs or whatever it is. We are soldiers of Christ and we've got to somehow Fight the good fight, as Paul said, until the end. Yeah. Can I just say a few words, Howard? Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> no, no, that yeah. was beautifully put. Uh, if anything, I'm, I'm, I seem to be on this channel most of the time as the go-to man for affliction, pain and suffering. That's why I did yeah. Voice in the Wilderness for yeah. years. Uh, and that seems to be my little niche, if you, if you want to say it that way. This, this very day, today, I received a, a lovely email from a, a lady called Becky who suffers with the same uh, illness that my wife does, Vicky, fibromyalgia. Uh, Vicky's the most godly person I know. She never moans, never complains. She's the complete opposite of me. She, she gives off the fragrance of Christ. Um, she is the epitome of a good, godly woman. She's lost her 40s, her whole decade in her 40s, to this illness mm. called fibromyalgia. Um, her sleep is almost non-existent. Her body pain is off the charts. Um, her brain fog and her aversion to all sorts of light noise and stuff is just off the charts. She is in discomfort virtually all the time. I'm not. Bodily, physically, I'm not. Does it mean I'm any different? No, it means nothing, it means nothing of the sort. I have an affliction of the mind, okay, which I've carried with me for over 30 years. What God has done with that is made, he's made me and my wife dependent mm. on God. Now, if we weren't so, honestly, if you, could, if you could travel with me for a day, a day in my life, yes, you see the laughter and the jokes and this, that and the other on Rev TV, and that is my general essence. But I tell you now that, that I walk in, in pain, in sorrow, in tribulation, in, in trouble, in my mind and in my spirit. Um, did I ask for it? No. Uh, would I love it to be gone 
yesterday? Yes, I absolutely would. But it doesn't make you any less of a Christian, saved, redeemed and heaven bound, if you've accepted the blood of Jesus. If you walk with an affliction, many of the afflictions of the righteous, uh, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord mm. delivers us from them all, normally by grace, normally by grace. God is not the author of sickness, far from it. In fact, the complete opposite. But we live in a cursed world, in a fallen world, and some of the greatest saints that have gone before us, and dare say that will come behind us, will walk with a limp, okay? And that limp may be a whole variety of things, but many will walk with a limp. I would love not to carry my affliction. Vicky would love not to be physically struggling so much every day. My friend Becky would love not to be. She's lost four years being housebound. She's younger than me. But it doesn't mean that you're any less of a Christian. And I get, I, I, I do worry that a lot of guilt is, con, is uh, conveyed over the airwaves by many Christian ministers who come out with the Isaiah 53, by your stripes you are healed, and they place guilt on the shoulders mm. of a multitude of God-fearing men and women who, through no fault of their own often, are carrying some sort of illness. By your stripe, by the Lord's stripes, you are healed. That healing has taken place spiritually. Spiritually, you are absolutely forgiven, redeemed, and on your way to heaven. But I don't know anyone yet with a glorified body. No one. It's to come, OK? So don't carry guilt. Carry on hoping, Ricky. And always pray, always pray, because the healing of the body is included in the atonement. We're going to get glorified bodies one day. But whatever you do, don't carry your, don't carry uh, a barometer of your spirit, of your mental or your physical well-being as a barometer of your spiritual health. Do not do that, because I went for a 50-year-old health check the other day, and I was off the charts. Thank God, because physically I am very fit, very strong, and praise God all is well. But if she went down my, you know, my spiritual mind check, I would be, <laughs> I'd be struggling so much. Does that make me any less of anything? No, it doesn't. It's just the way it is. And that's my little rant. Derek, any words? <laughs> well, no, I don't want to override, but uh, I would say that generally to have the attitude of drawing closer to Christ, you know, there will always be situations as like we won't understand till we get to heaven why things didn't work out the way we did. But it does say that as we abide, John 15, as we abide in Christ and he in us, you know, we'll, we can ask and God will hear us. I think the more we have that personal relationship to him, then we, we are able to receive more from him. Whereas if we are separated from him, we're less able to receive. And so cultivate that, that closeness with the Lord. I can't guarantee that every prayer you pray will be answered, but I believe you'll, you'll find a, a, you'll ch the more you tune into God, the more you will be able to do that. I think one attitude we can have that a lot of Christians kind of have is that they, they see God as their servant. So God, why aren't you doing this for me? And why aren't you doing that for me? And that actually... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of everything. So we need to understand when we, we are God's servant and we are here to do his will, he is not our servant. And if we stop treating God like our servant, uh, but rather submit ourselves to God, <coughs> then we are in a better position f for our mm. prayers to be answered. Very beautifully yeah. put, Derek. Beautiful. <coughs> beautiful. Got a lovely one here from Marcus, and this is definitely Derek's... Uh, Forte, is there a difference between the tribulation and God's wrath? Is this perceived difference the reason for mid-tribbers? Um, the tribulation and the time of God's wrath, or I like to call it the day of the Lord, is the same thing. They, they're just two aspects of the same period of time. The, the tribulation begins with the first seal in heaven, and that, which is a judgment initiated from heaven because it's Christ opening the seals that starts the tribulation. So it's called the tribulation because, of course, it is a time of great trouble on the earth. But that's not the best title for that period of time because the, the essence of this time is it's not just like the church age, yes, we have tribulation, but it's different because it's God's judgment. It's the t at, this, at this time, God generally is not moving in judgment. But in the tribulation, he's moving in judgment. The seals, the trumpets, the bowls of wrath. And so this is the time of God's wrath. 
which is yet to come, and it's a time of judgment. It's called the Day of the Lord. Now, the people who believe in mid-tribulation, they accept the principle as pre-tribbers, such as myself, that we are not appointed unto wrath. There's a number of scriptures that say that we've been delivered from the wrath of God, so we are not appointed to go through the wrath of the tribulation. The different views tend to be on when does the wrath start in the tribulation. If you believe as I do, and to me, which is obvious, that the wrath of God, the judgment of God, starts with the first seal, then the, tr then the rapture must be before the first seal. If, however, the mid-trib people, they kind of say, well, the first half of the, the thing is, is tribulation, but it's not the wrath of God. And so they would say the wrath only begins maybe with the seventh trumpet, maybe. And so they think that that is the time when the wrath starts, and that's why the rapture's there. They miss the point that actually the wrath starts with the first seal. That's Christ opening the seal. It's Christ releasing judgments on the earth right from the start. It's just that the judgments intensify. And then there's the pre-wrath view, which is quite complicated, but essentially they kind of have it kind of three quarters of the way through, with, because they believe that the wrath only starts with the bowls of wrath. But actually, if you read Revelation 15, it says that the opening of the bowls of wrath is the time when the wrath of God is being completed. It's not the start of the wrath of God, it's the completion of the final act. So, the, but, but all of those views, except for the post-trib view, accept the principle that the rapture should be before the wrath of God. But they, they differ in when does the wrath start. Okay. Yeah. In Revelation 7, it talks about this seal. Um, let me read it. It said, After this I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or the sea. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the bonds servants yeah. of our God on the, in the foreheads. It talks about this, the whole th situation yeah. here and who comes out of the Great Tribulation, chapter 7. Mm. Um, so is this, so, I know the other, there's the other bowls as well. Oh yeah, P push well, I, I, I cover this in great detail yeah. in my book, by yeah. the way, on the book of Revelation. And I'll take you more than an hour to read it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, what you've got actually is, is that, um, You've got the church raptured in heaven, represented by the 24 elders in Revelation 4 and 5. <coughs> then on the same day, there's no time delay, once they've established that the Lamb is worthy to open the seals, he starts opening the first six seals immediately. But then there's a time delay, uh, during which the 144,000 are prepared, because they've got to get saved. There's no witnesses around now, because the church is raptured. So there's a period of time in which God has to get these saved and prepared for their ministry. So who knows how long that will be, a few months. And so the seventh seal, the first six seals are open straight away. The seventh seal, there's a delay. And the seventh seal releases the seven trumpets, which is a intensification of the judgment. And what he's saying is, don't let those angels blow their trumpets yet until we've sealed these 144,000. So let's say six months, I don't know how long, but six months is the time in, until these 144,000 are sealed and protected from the coming judgments. Then the seventh seal is opened in heaven, chapter eight, verse one, and then the trumpets judgments are released. And when it talks about the trumpet judgments are direct bombardments against the trees and against the different realms of the earth, the, the waters and so on. And, so, and that's why it says don't, the, those angels are not allowed to be released until the 144,000 are sealed. So, so that's what chapter seven's all about. And it, and it is uh, showing that even during the tribulation, God has prepared an outreach through these 144,000 for a great soul harvest in the tribulation. And then there's a vision of all the people that are saved, many of which will be killed by the Antichrist 
in the Great Tribulation. So it says right. they come out of the Great mm -hmm. Tribulation and that they are seen in heaven. So that is the fruit of the ministry of the 144,000 is, is seen in heaven. The harvest, yeah. yeah. I, I see in chapters 10 in Revelation as well, it talks about a time when the, these other things are going to be released. Uh, and it talks also that, or it mentions that, we, that whoever is left has got to prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So is there's a still a work to be done or... Th That's mid-tribulation. Yeah. So the, 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 the people on the earth who are left uh, are going to know for sure that they're, 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 they made the wrong but, choices. Mm. Right? In the sense that the other ones have already come out if you look at chapter 7. No, I, I, I don't quite see it like that. It's <laughs> like that, that is a vision showing all the people that will be saved and will come out of the Great Tribulation. That's the fruit of their ministry. Mm -hmm. it, it's a vision that sees, shows the end result of their ministry. But those are the ones that have, if you like, s s chosen to serve God because yeah, their robes yeah, are washed exactly. white. Yeah. So yeah. the clean, like yeah, the saved. So it's encouraging the people that get saved, even though mm. they're martyred, mm. they're going to end up well yeah. in heaven. Um, and then mid tribulation is when the mark of the beast comes in, and and that's when people, most people, will have made their decision by then, and uh, many will be martyred as a result of the the, uh, the mark of the beast. Again, I know it's a little bit patchy this, but I'm seeing in chapter eleven where it talks about the. Um, and their dead bodies will lie in the street. This is obviously two the saints, right? That's the two, oh, that's the two witnesses, yeah? Two witnesses will be killed by the Antichrist at mid-tribulation. Right, but it says here, um, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city. Mystically, it's called Solomon, Egypt. Um, but it says then those from the peoples and the tribes and the tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three yeah. and a half days, will not permit their bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate that they, you know, they send gifts to one another. I mean, so the, the, these people that are left, are, are, there's no redemption left. They're very, very anti-God, aren't they? Well, they, they are celebrating because the Antichrist, the two witnesses have called down all the trumpet judgments. Mm -hmm. And so they're blaming the two witnesses for all the judgments. And they think now they're, they're dead. Away now, they? Yeah. But they still got a chance to repent because the two witnesses are then resurrected from the dead and the, and the whole world sees that. So some people, many will repent even then at that sign. But then soon after that, the mark of the beast is going to kick in. And those who have not actually turned to God by this point, that's almost like their last chance. Yes, okay. Because when the mark comes in, most people who haven't repented will just take the mark just to stay in the system, you know, just to, for their own survival. Wow, good stuff. Yeah. Stay in the EU? <laughs> Basically, in the We're still fighting Brexit at this time. We know in the trying. tribulation, God is forcing everyone to make their decision one well, way or the other. He will give everyone a chance well, to I, repent and hear yeah. the gospel. But then the, if they take the mark of the beast, that's it. There's, there's no chance to be saved after that. That's so right. everyone is being forced in yes. quick time yeah. to make their final decision. Be interested to see what happens on uh, Halloween this year. Oh, yes, I'm now, I'm now with what, you. Brexit. Brexit, yeah. Well, yeah, but also to, to actually use that particular date. Spiritually, yeah. yeah is really it's interesting. But it is a positive it's, date as well. Well, it is for the saints, but then the, the, the other connotation and connection is obviously with the it's demonic. It's also the, the um, anniversary of the Reformation. Is it? Luther. Oh. Mm. Well, maybe that's a new beginning. So you can put different angles on it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. God may have chosen that date as a the chance for a new start, as it were. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Got a great one here from Joel in Port Down. Well, I'm uh, leaving now then. <laughs> <laughs> These are tough ones tonight. Well, this one is this one's another honest one. God bless. My question is this: Will we be held accountable? for not bringing members of our families to Christ, even though we try to live as best we can as a testimony, like myself, as a recovering alcoholic, without any breakthroughs, because their hearts are so hardened. I pray daily for them, but we are constantly under attack from the devil. So basically, Joel's saying, we will be held accountable. No, I mean, for unsaved we problems. are accountable to pray for them yeah. and to w share with them, witness to them as we're able to, you know. Um, Ezekiel. And as he says, 
to live well before them. So, uh, no, we're not accountable for, I mean, they're ultimately they're accountable for how they've responded to Christ. If you think of Noah, bless him, he preached for a hundred years and yet only a few got saved, uh, but he was faithful. So yes, we do, are, we are responsible to share the gospel or at least, you know, in, in the way that we can, um, but we're not responsible for their decision in the end. Pray for them, give them a witness, don't overdo it, but find a way in which you can get the word to them. Ezekiel 18 is a bit more direct in the sense yeah. that if we don't warn the wicked of their ways, then we the are bloods, accountable. Yeah, that's it. But You're I not suppose... responsible for the result, but yeah. you are responsible to give a witness. Yeah. Yeah. It is hard because you, you, it's harder these days because it, you, we, we, people scorn and laugh at you. And but there's different ways to do it. You can give them a book. You can give them, you know, a tract. A tract. Mm. You can give them a CD. Yeah. You know, there are subtle ways you can do it yeah, yeah. rather than, you know. Yeah. You Creative shall ways. not. <laughs> We're all the Turn same. or burn. Yeah. Normally thou yeah. shalt not doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't, does it? No. But there, there are ways, creative yeah. ways. If you ask yeah. God for a creative mm -hmm. way. I think people, if your demeanour is right and you can attract people to God through a, your, uh, a nice, yeah, nice yeah. spirit that is, um, you or know, a gentle spirit. Give them a DVD, a Christian film. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ask God, he'll show you some way you can do it. Yeah. With that, which isn't necessarily confrontational. Yeah. Right. Good stuff. Down to our last, we're well into our last five minutes, but I think hopefully you can squeeze this one in. Another one from Portadown. Tom, dear Rev TV, will God judge us for sins we've done after we've become Christians? As I struggled a lot with alcohol, but God set me free now, so I'm relieved to have been set free. Praise our Lord Jesus. And that's from Tom. So will God judge us for sins after we've become Christians? Well, I would say that um, our salvation is through the blood of Christ. So we're not... But the, the judgment we will face is a judgment for our works as, as Christians. Now, there is the verse that says, if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. So I believe that which we confess and bring to the light now and get God's forgiveness for, um, whether it's recently or in the past, then God's not going to bring that up on that judgment day because we've judged ourselves and we've confessed it. Um, but our sins does have an effect on our rewards in the sense that if we spent 20 years sinning and then we repent, yeah, God forgives us, but that's 20 years wasted. So that will affect our eternal rewards because the judge, we're, not, we're not judged for condemnation now. Christ has taken that judgment. The judgment we have when we stand before Christ, it says his fire will burn through our lives and it will burn out all the, the dross, the wood hay, stubble and only that which we have done in the Lord as it were will, will remain for our eternal reward so if we've wasted a lot of time in sin even though we get forgiven we, we will have lost opportunity, opportunity for yeah. reward so our sin does make a difference yes it does. I don't want to minimize it our, even though God forgives it we, we suffer loss of eternal reward so but if we will judge ourselves now about that sin God's not going to bring that up Brilliant. again. He, he's forgiven and he's, as it were, forgotten. So basically, as Christians, we only stand at the beam of judgment seat, exactly. not the great white throne. Exactly. Because if you're at the great white throne, you're in a wrong place, aren't you? That's right. You're in a wrong place. That's right. You are, it says you've passed from death to life. Yeah, wow. Jesus took your judgment. Do you know, I, 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 uh, Tom, I struggle with that as well. I often, I often worry about my <coughs> sin now, uh, which is sometimes quite, quite a lot when I'm really, really struggling. Um, but I'm, I'm, I always come back to the cross. It's the blood of Jesus on your life mm. that is the deciding mm. factor. You trying to work things out and, and rep repent 58 times a day and, and do this and do that, it, it all gets a bit ritualistic and a bit perfunctory in the end. It's the blood of Jesus mm. which ultimately pays your sin debt. Mm. You know? 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins because he is our QC. He is our advocate, yeah. isn't he, Derek? You know? Amen. We're well into our last minute, Howard, so do you want to... 25 right. seconds, here okay. we go. Pastor Derek, absolutely fantastic to have you with us again Thank today you. and helping us. Uh, so many good scriptures uh, that need to be shared uh, still 
and uh, we'll be having you back very, very soon. Please. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, Howard. We are in the last few seconds. I just want to say, get into the Word of God, you know, and just study it and appeal to God to have your sins forgiven and he will be faithful to forgive you. Amen. Amen.